Hello, everyone. My name is Robin Lloyd. I'm a member of the Women's International League for Peace and Freedom, and I'm here with uh, Sandy Baird, who is a member and the leader of the Vermont Institute of Community and International Involvement. Our guest today is Moji Agra, an Iranian-American peace activist currently living in Arizona, but whose family in is living in Narats in central Iran, uh, which is one of the targets that Benjamin Netanyahu has uh, designated to be bombed if there is war with Iran. We are very anxious here. I think people are very anxious there. And I'm so glad we have uh, Moji here to explain what people are feeling like in Iran. Can you tell us your family and your background uh, to help us understand what's going on? Sure. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon. And I thank you, Sandy and Robin, and the Burlington branch of the Women's International Peace and Freedom. And also, I thank the Town Meeting TV studio for mm -hmm. recording this conversation. And I, I just want to make one correction. I, am, I live in Colorado, and you said Arizona. I used to live in Arizona for many, many years. But now, I, since 2018, I've been living in uh, Boulder, Colorado. And um, as far as the, my family and relatives who live in Natanz and, and Tehran and some other locations in the country, as well as some of them abroad in different countries, obviously they are anxious. Uh, and, and especially the ones who live in Natanz have this feeling of, Okay, it's gonna. If it's gonna happen, it's gonna happen. We can't do anything about it, and uh, so there is a sense of despair. There is a sense of anxiousness, and and they are also within members of my family and relatives. There is a diversity of views regarding regarding the Israeli and U.S foreign policy as it applies to Iran. Yes. So that's that's my initial, I guess, answer to your question about my my uh, the reaction of my own family and relatives. Uh, could you could you explain uh, what uh, what is what the nuclear facility is that the mainstream media claims is deep down in the tunnels below Natanz. What are they doing down there? And where does, where does Iran get its uranium? Is it, do they grow it or is it from their own mines or do they import it? Um, the Natanz is the site of the main nuclear enrichment facility of Iran. And, um, and as far as the nuclear materials are concerned, uh, they, I guess I'm not sure whether they, where they import them from or whether they have uranium. I think they have uranium mines uh, from which they get the yellow cake and then they enrich the uranium in Natanz uh, as well as in another facility in Fordo in the Qom province. And so they, they, uh, they enrich the uranium and then they store them. And uh, so they have been uh, trying to, uh, as, as, as the Western media says, uh, become nuclear, uh, become uh, ready or be, be in a state of if they so wish to to develop nuclear uh, capability, um, I mean, to the military nuclear capability, and but they are 
they, the, the government, the, the regime, frames it basically as creating deterrence against, uh, against Israeli aggression as, as well as American aggression against, uh, against Iran. And whether it has deterrence or not, that's open to question. And I am not in, in the area of my expertise, by the way. You're asking me questions that I am, as a social scientist, as a retired psychologist, I am not qualified to comment on. Do you want to ask a question well, about the... Um, Okay, so what you're saying, I believe, is that, that uh, at Natanz, there is a nuclear facility of some sort. However, Iran says that whatever development has occurred, these, this nuclear facility is not a bomb-making uh, facility, that it, if anything, right. it is for a power plant, which, of right. course, the United States has all over the place, and France has power plants, nuclear power plants everywhere. Although people don't like them much, they appear to be legal. Um, at least in the countries that want them and, and want nuclear f uh, power. So what's the problem then? Why is the United States, okay, going back a little bit, the United States has been hostile to Iran essentially all the 20th century. What gives, in your opinion, why is the United States, why is Israel hostile to a, a kind of a... Um, underdeveloped, I would say, country like Iran, who is, as far as I can tell, Iran's never invaded anybody. Even when it was Persia, it did not invade anybody. And the United States, however, seems intent on destroying Iran, and I don't understand it. Do you? Well, <laughs> um, okay. Let me, in 1953, CIA and MI6, with the help of the newly created State of Israel committed a coup uh, overthrowing Iran's secular democracy. Correct. Right. Uh, 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 and the Prime Minister, Dr. Mossadegh. And Dr. Dr. Mossadegh, of which, I mean, I, I, in 2012, with the encouragement of Professor Noam Chomsky, I founded a project called the Mossadegh Legacy Institute. And uh, so one of the things that, that Dr. Mossadegh said after the coup, he said, internal despotism, internal dictatorship in a developing country, so, you know, in Asia and Africa, for example, Iran, internal despotism and external colonialism mm -hmm. are two, two sides of the same coin. In other words, they are mutually interdependent. Now, the, the, at the time, Iran's the Shah, who, who, whose government was overthrown in the 1979 revolution, after 20, 25 years after the coup in 1953, uh, the, the United States was the colonial power and the Shah was the despotic uh, ruler of Iran and they needed one another directly as so-called friends. And the, the current state of affairs, especially after the revolution in Iran, is that the internal despotism uh, of the regime in Iran that claims to be Islamic is interdependent with external colonialism as enemies. So the, the two sides need one another, in a sense, as enemies in order to justify, on the part of the regime in Iran, to justify its... its uh, you know, dictatorial rule in the name of Islam, and then on the colonial side, U.S. and Israel, they need an enemy in Iran in order to justify, you know, for example, every, every year we have $1.1 trillion uh, in terms of U.S. military and 
and uh, security and intelligence budget. That is, these are the, these are, this is the budget, $1.1 trillion every year that we know of. So in order to justify this kind of budgeting, taking away from human needs in order to give it to the military industrial complex, as General Eisenhower, the one who overthrew Mossadegh, said at the end of his presidency, in order to justify this kind of uh, militaristic budgeting, you need to create an enemy. You need to maintain a, a state of animosity, which then inside Iran has found a constituency that is unfortunately claims to be Islamic. I am a Sufi Muslim and, um, and I am uh, I'm also a member, a, a Muslim member of, of Jewish Voice for Peace. So as my Jewish sisters and brothers, uh, when they say to the government of Israel, uh, not in our name, I say to, this, to the regime in Iran, not in my name as a Muslim, not in my name, you can impose hijab, head cover, uh, on women against the teachings of Islam, that is. Okay, so um... so this, this interdependence as enemy of internal despotism and external colonialism, I think it's a very useful frame to kind of understand what is happening. Okay, did you want to? Yeah. Okay, just uh, one of the reasons uh, I asked a, a friend recently why is the mainstream media so intent Here. on us hating Iran? Right. And the answer this person gave was, well, they support terrorism. They support <laughs> terrorists. And of course, um, we know who she's talking about, Hezbollah, Hamas, and the Houthis. Now, I mean, those groups, I don't really know um, all that they do, but they are a lot more than just military forces. They are, um, they are the governments. The Houthis are the government. Anyway, would you explain, or, or Sandy, if you have a, a view of it, uh, why, um, how, what, what, how you see it, those forces that are called terrorist by our, by our mainstream media. Well, if I may, um, do, do you, Sandy, do you want to say something or yeah. should I answer? Yeah. Um, I believe that those groups developed, I don't think they're terrorist groups. I think that even suggesting that they're terrorist groups, that, that nomenclature comes from the United States of America and Israel. Who are, I mean, I think American citizens should be asking exactly, what is Hamas? Who is Hamas? Hamas is a political group that contains individuals. By calling it Hamas, it's some... Um, out of body organization? No, it consists of individuals who are acting a lot on behalf of the people of those areas, like Gaza. They are, uh, Hamas has a military side, uh, I would say a defensive military, largely. Um, similarly with Hezbollah, they're part of the political organizations of those countries and they began, I think, as attempts to actually serve the people who the government of Lebanon, the government of Israel certainly, were, was not serving the needs of the people in terms of schooling, in terms of food and shelter. So some groups had to develop to take care of the people of those areas. The, it's the United States, but they learned in the process of those occupations. You got to remember, Israel occupies Gaza. That um, in the in terms of those occupations, they apparently resisted occupation, as all peoples of the world have the right to do. They have a right to resist occupation, and that's really what happened. Mm -hmm. it happened to Hezbollah. It happened to Hamas. I don't know that much about the Houthis, but I believe it's the same thing. Well, they are fighting back against occupation. Well, let's hear your position on that. Well, I, well, 
in terms of, by the way, I've been called as an American, Iranian American peace and nonviolence activist um, who, who has been critical of the US and Israeli foreign policy. I've been called a, a sleeping cell of terrorism as well as a, of course, anti-Semite right. by definition. Uh, so I think the, the demonization and the dehumanization of the people in that part of the world, which was chronicled very accurately by the late Palestinian, Christian Palestinian, uh, you know, scholar, the late Dr. Edward Said in his seminal book, Orientalism, can explain how the Western media shapes the public opinion in the so-called civilized West to then say the other, the, it's an otherism of the, of the Islamic world in which, in which uh, Muslims are called potential terrorism, terrorists. And so whenever they try to resist external colonialism, exactly. they, they are accused of being a terrorist, what they're doing, they are resisting external colonialism. Unfortunately, in the process of resisting external colonial, colonialism, they become internally despotic. And that relationship between internal despotism and external colonialism as interdependent uh, is very important to understand. Wow. Well, thank you. Uh, that's, a, that's a very um, interesting uh, description. Now, we only have a few minutes more. Um, what are you doing uh, to help people understand what's going on in Iran and how to uh, build up uh, forces for peace? Could you tell us about the chambers of compassion that you have started? Sure. Sure. I, um, after I founded the Mossadegh Legacy Institute I, in 2012, I, I began a project. I said, OK, what, what legacy of Dr. Mossadegh, the Gandhi of Iran, I wanted to American people to know about? And that was his nonviolence. Um, and, and so I began a traveling, uh, speaking tour, creating circles of nonviolence, and which is now called Chambers of Compassion. The purpose of the Chambers of Compassion, or intersectional circles, as its other name is, is to create in each community a place akin to the chambers of commerce for corporations, a, in each community, a place uh, for systemic collaboration across civil society causes, so that the work of peace activists and environmental activists and human rights activists and social justice activists and democracy activists, healthcare activists, LGBTQ activists, whatever our good cause, we don't have a place presently in each community that is called the same thing everywhere, like the Chamber of Commerce is, for the purpose of building systemic collaboration across cause so that we can build the critical mass that is needed in order to then have the numbers necessary in order to we, the people, to be able to assert our power, our democratic power, from the bottom, uh, trying to influence public policy in this country, including foreign policy, so that, so that every year $1.1 trillion don't go to defense and intelligence, and instead some of that money uh, would go to human needs budgeting, as, as it's called. The other thing that I'm doing, and I just did it this past weekend, I began a, with the collaboration of a gentleman, a veteran inside Iran, uh, 
to create something called the Iranian Veterans for Peace. Iranian Veterans for Peace. I am a associate member of the Veterans for Peace as an American organization. The Iranian Veterans for Peace is an organization in the, in the process of being born, uh, it, the purpose of which is to, one of the purposes of which is to, to have live conversations between peace-seeking veterans of Iran and America. So that, so that the mutual demonization that goes on uh, ends and is replaced with mutual peace building. Okay. Wow. Well, thank you. That's that's uh, very interesting. I hope people who are on this Zoom call with us and people who view this on uh, CCTV in the weeks to come will Google Chambers of Compassion and see whether we can make that happen here in our community. So any final words, any yeah, comment from I, you, Sandy? I just want to thank you for being with us. I think that this is a really long discussion. I don't believe that most Americans probably know where Iran even is. They certainly don't know why, it would seem to me, this country is so hostile to Iran. This needs a lot of discussion, mm -hmm. a lot more programs, to because that is going to be the center of this new war. And Israel apparently seems determined to attack Iran. Yeah. in our recent weeks. So please come back with us at some point and so that we can try to educate people about this very, very important issue. So thank you. Yes. Thank, thank you, you so very much. much. And I'm hoping that with the help of both of your organizations, we can have a, a you know, a Burlington, Vermont uh, area chamber of compassion mm -hmm. and all the other people who hear me please contact me so that I can then, I have written all this thing down as to how to get a chamber of compassion or okay. intersectional circle going in, so that you can do it in your area. Great, thank you. All right. Thank you. Thank, thank you, you very much. Thank you. May, thank you. may your family be safe, safe and protected there in Iran. Thank you so much. Yeah. I hope Goodbye. so too. Thank you. Bye-bye.